please rise as you are able for the chiming of the hour and the presentation of the word. Good morning and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church on this Officer Ordination and Installation Sunday. Some happy news to start off with this morning. We are so pleased 
to have our pastor, Kyle Allen, and his family back in worship with us. We are so grateful to God for your recovery and, and well-being. Other good news, the session has approved the long-range planning team's long-range plan for Covenant, and that plan will be released to the congregation this week, so be on the lookout for it. I encourage you to take a close look at the blue insert inside your bulletin. There are a number of activities and service opportunities found in the blue insert, including the Super Bowl of Caring, volunteering at Feeding Southwest Virginia, as well as the congregational meeting that's scheduled for next Sunday. So please just take a closer look. There are many, many more things listed in the blue insert. But let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God.
I invite you now to rise and join me in our call to worship. By God's Spirit, we were baptized into one body and chosen by God for loving service to the world. Let us sing praises to God for making us partners in mission. Let us worship God in wonder and joy. does the Lord require of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God? Let us pray. Eternal God, we seek to live the Christian life, but confess we are not always in harmony with your will. You call us to proclaim the truth in love, but there are times when we are silent. You command us to do what is just, but too often we are idle. You beckon us to live humbly before you, but minor matters distract us. Forgive us and transform us so that we may follow your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news. Let it be shared with all the world. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And welcome to all of our children and the families who are worshiping with us here and online. It's so good to see you, Miss Maisie. And we talked a couple of weeks ago about the colors of the church. And Maisie, what color do you see a lot of today? The flowers and the... Red. red. There is red everywhere. And red is a reminder that the Holy Spirit, yes, is with us. And today is Ordination and Installation Sunday, and there are some very special women and men who have been called, and they are answering the call of God's Spirit to serve in our church. So it is a special day indeed. Well, I'm going to wonder, I'm going to ask you if you would play kind of a search and find with me this morning. Could you find a cross? Do you see 
a cross in here anywhere? Oh, there's one on the candle. And, ooh, do you see the big one up there? Yeah, so there, sometimes, oh, and we see them on the choir robes, yes. The cross is a sacred symbol. It is a sign of God's love. Jesus is our Savior and our Lord who lived and died and rose again for us. And that is what the cross reminds us of. Could you find, this one's easy, could you find a candle? <laughs> the candle is a sacred symbol of the light of Christ. Jesus is the light of the world, showing us God's holy way. Could you find a Bible, or do you know where we usually keep them in the pews? Usually, well, I know we've got a big one up there. And the Bible is our book of faith. And Jesus is the word of God made flesh. Yes, you can see them under the chairs there, who came to live among us. Now, this one's a little tricky, but could you find water? I'll go stand and show you. You can come up here with me if you want. Ooh, where could we find water? Could you dip your fingers in there? Water. <laughs> All right. Did you know there was water in there? Water is a sign of God's grace. And Jesus gives us living water so that we may never be thirsty. And it's also a reminder of our baptism. Could you find where we have bread? It's here. It's just a little hidden right now. Do you see bread under there? Oh, yep, there it is. Bread is the body of Christ, and Jesus is the bread of heaven, the food of everlasting life. And then finally, can you find a cup? Yeah, there are two cups up here, and the cup is a sign of God's promise. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches growing together in faith, hope, and love. And those are some of the sacred symbols we have all around our worship space. Would you pray with me? Would you be my echo? Dear God, thank you for these sacred symbols that remind us of your presence and your love. Help us be reminded that you love us all through the week. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful week. Will you pray with me? Holy God, without your spirit to guide us, we would be lost. Be with us now in the reading and the hearing of your word, that we might understand it more fully and apply it to our lives of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our reading for this Lord's Day is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Listen for God's word to you. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed unto you as of first importance that what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of who, whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. 
For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I per persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have longed to be back with you all, and it is good to see you this Lord's Day. Of first importance. I love that phrase. Paul uses it in spades explicitly and implicitly throughout the passage Bob just read. I'm going to ask you at this point to take out your pew Bibles. Turn to page 155 in the New Testament. And I want us to look together at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4. Those verses read, For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Going down on the page a little further, let your eye fall on the second verse, which is 1 Corinthians 15, actually verses 8 to 10. After a long list of post-resurrection appearances where Christ personally reveals himself to a long list of disciples, Paul proclaims, last of all, as to one untimely born, which simply means that Paul did not feel worthy to have been called, that it came to him, that is, Christ came to him and called him, and appeared to him. And in that sense, he too was born anew. Last of all, as to one untimely born, Paul says, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. Before I go further in the sermon, let me remind you that this 15th chapter in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is all about the resurrection. And Paul will repeat himself by saying that if you have not believed that Jesus Christ has been crucified and risen from the dead, and if this world your hope is only, then your fate is pitiful. And you are to be pitied most of all. So here now in these verses, in verses 3 and 4 and also 8 to 10, why, why is it that these verses and what they say are of first importance? Here's what I think. They all essentially say the same thing. If God's revelation in Christ to us is not first personal, it will never go public. It will never be the baseline by which we measure our faith, build our Christian character, and honor our commitments to live out our faith. It's just that crucial. Let me put it more clearly. When you first made your public profession of faith, whether before or after baptism, whether attending a confirmation class or receiving other Christian training and discipleship, isn't what you said you believed when you joined the church 
similar to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 3. Let me bring it even closer to home. Those three verses are the focal point of the Apostles' Creed, are they not? Where we say together, I believe in Jesus Christ, crucified, dead and buried, and who on the third day rose again from the dead. I will tell you, when I made my public profession of faith and was baptized, and yes, it happened in that way, the profession of faith before baptism, by my childhood pastor, Dr. Whitley, he asked me in the good King James fashion, do you believe the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I ask you, do you hear echoes of Paul's words to the Corinthians here too? And when it comes time for us to participate in the service of office or ordination and installation, we will hear the same words spoken. Oh, yes, we will. In the Apostles' Creed and res resonating new and fresh with us and beckoning yet again a faithful response, not only from our incoming officers, but from all of us. Here's the first question our officers will be asked today. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, Acknowledge him, Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baseline, foundational, personal first before going public. Indeed, how can one answer yes to this question honestly? If there is no personal relationship with the Christ of the cross and the empty tomb. If these touchstones are not the foundation on which our faith is built, Paul says, if these are but lip service without a core commitment to Christ, who died on the cross to save the world and us from our sins, and who was raised up by God in triumph over sin and death, then I tell you this, is it not true that our faith is vain and our integrity as disciples is a sham? I have never seen in writing anywhere how the ordination vows within our Presbyterian Church USA Book of Order came to be. But I've always believed the first question asked of would-be officers was put there intentionally to show us that it is of first importance, no matter our calling in life, and that it is the primary question of first importance upon which all the other questions and their answers hinge. That one question, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, and believe him to be Lord and head of the church, Lord of all creation? Think about it. When you answer that question to become a member of the church or to serve as an officer and acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the your there truly was personal. It was relational. It was of first importance. And if the building of that relationship is not nurtured and deepened and maturing over time, how can your faith or mind be sustained? You tell me. Let alone treat it as utmost in importance. A couple of Sundays ago, Paul Weary led our adult class. I believe Jennifer mentioned that last week is too, too. He asked a simple question. Can you name the Ten Commandments in order? Can you name the Ten Commandments in order? Thankfully, we as a class knew them, but honestly, it took us a little while to get them in order. Since that day, in anticipation of sharing this homily, I have thought about our discussion on the Ten Commandments with the first four centered on the love of God and the last six on the love of neighbor. Take a look at them again when you get home. 
thinking along those lines and acknowledging they remain of first importance as we consider the ways we live the Christian life. I paired them, yes I did, with what Paul was putting across in those opening verses in chapter 15. And I discovered the sentiments to be strikingly similar. Listen, the Lord your God is one God and you shall have no other gods before him, Moses says. This is of first importance. And everything else that follows, everything you do, everything else you become, is to be subsidiary to this primary belief in God who by His grace brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and who called them as us today to live as God's children of hope and promise, joy and love, obligation and righteousness. Paul says, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received by God's grace, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he died, and that God raised him on the third day. This too is of first importance, beloved, for us as a church. For the church exists to serve the world for Christ's sake. That's what we should be all about. The church exists to serve the world for Christ's sake. And to share by its life and witness the very love of God in Christ always, but especially, especially when it would be so tempting to do otherwise. Why is this of first importance today? Here are some thoughts. In a world filled with hate speech, racial profiling, police shootings, false accusations, rampant tribalism, cancel culture, moral lapses, power politics, and gross injustice, I will tell you of first importance is that the church share the good news only the church has to share. The good news of Jesus Christ. That Christ is risen and our joy knows no end. Our sins are forgiven and we are free to love and serve the Lord with humility. Humility is our guide, kindness is our motto, and loving justice for all as our deepest desire. While earthly doubts and divisions dot the global landscape, our confidence is in Christ alone, who calls us to love God and our neighbors without discrimination. In the same ways we would want to be loved and respected for who we are and not judged for who we aren't. While the pandemic lingers, its tight grasp upon us may be loosening with the hope of vaccines for ages five, that is under five, still rising every day. And to this new world emerging, the church universal and God's church, this local congregation called Covenant Presbyterian, needs now more than ever to heed Paul's words, to heed the words also of Moses before him and Christ's words especially as Lord and Savior of both church and world. It is time for us to rise up to reclaim what is of first important importance, which is for its officers, its officers, to live out the oaths they make to serve Christ as Savior and Lord and head of the church, to love God and each other, to work, yes, go to work in harmony with one another, and to join Covenant's members, friends, and staff in working together to build the future God has in store for this congregation that has been faithfully expressed in the long-range plan that now has been approved by your session.
after a whole lot of work by a long-range planning team. At this table, today, and in the days to come, we will find our sustenance. In our mission, we will join as one. In our officers, we will put our faith and hold them accountable to the promises they make, just as they will hold us accountable to fulfill with them the mission God has for this congregation going forward. In our commitment to the Lord and head of the church, Jesus Christ, we will discover, yes, we will discover, it may not be an easy journey, but we will discover our way together as a congregation. I can assure you, joyfully, and faithfully, because that's who we are, with a whole lot of love thrown in there in between. Joyfully and faithfully in service to the living God, and in doing so, we will, oh yes, we will, honor what truly is of first importance. To God be the glory for his son, the Christ. To God be the glory for the church who follows in the way he leads. Amen.
considering what is of first importance and desiring to help somebody with what the church has to offer. Let us make our morning offering to God and also during this week discern ways how we can help our Lord with the work ongoing in the world. Beloved in Christ, people shall come from north and south, east and west, to sit at the banquet table of the Lord. All are welcome here to share the bread of life and drink the cup of blessing. Come, let us break bread together. 
Will you join Jennifer and me in prayer? Let us pray. Lord, we come to this table with joy, eager to share communion with you and each other. We come from different places and spaces, seeking the solace and counsel only you can give. We come to you, the beloved, confident that we are loved by you beyond belief. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for your tender mercy. In the spirit of the living God, amen. We come now to the words of institution. Jennifer and I will be sharing those. And in sharing those, first the bread, you will be invited to take that. And then Jennifer will share the words regarding the cup. And you will be invited to take that. So in this spirit, let us receive these words of institution in the meal that God has prepared for us through his beloved Son, the Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said unto his disciples whom he loved, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so it is in the name of our Lord and Savior, we share now the bread of salvation. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And in the name of the crucified, risen Lord of life, let us drink the cup of blessing and offer our silent prayers. Will you please stand?
Okay. Okay, I'm here. I'll stand here. Jimmy, come stand right there. Just come stand. It'll be okay. The spirit moves. Beloved, we are reminded in the waters of baptism, each of us is called to ministry in Jesus' name. But within the active membership of the church, God likewise calls persons to serve as officers in the ordered ministries of the church. And so today, through prayer and the virtual laying on of hands, we will ordain and install those officers who have been called to serve faithfully as deacons and ruling elders. Concerning the nature of the offices which they are about to undertake, let us recall that elders, according to Scripture, are to be persons of wisdom and mature faith, compassionate in the Spirit as well. Chosen by God, they are to use their gifts as spiritual leaders to discern and measure the congregation's fidelity to the Word of God and to strengthen and nurture the life of the congregation in its ongoing witness to Jesus Christ. And let us likewise recall that deacons, according to Scripture, are to be persons of spiritual character, honest repute, live exemplary lives, brotherly and sisterly love, sincere compassion, and sound judgment. Their calling is to share in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ for the hungry, the sick, the poor, the lost, the friendless, the oppressed, or anyone else under distress. They serve at the will of the session to perform other vital functions associated with Sunday morning worship and other special services and with the upkeep of the church's real and personal property. So it is now. We turn to the questions of ordination and installation. To your incoming officers, will you please answer the following questions by replying yes with God's help? Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord and head of the church. And through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? Will you fulfill your ministry of obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions, will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? And do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you?
for those who are to be elders. Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And for those serving as deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Meg Mutton, our clerk of session, has questions for the congregation this Lord's Day. I'd also ask the congregation now as a whole, if you would stand, as a sign of your loving support for those who will serve as ruling elders and deacons in the class of 2024. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, throughout the centuries, you have raised gracious and loving people committed to you to serve as faithful leaders. You have poured into them your spirit, calling them and leading them to be persons of integrity and seekers after your own heart. You have led them in the ways of wisdom and justice according to your will. And you have guided them to serve your church with the greatest of energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Keep your hand upon them all their days. Hold them accountable to the sacred vows they have made. And Lord, as we ask now for Jennifer and for Laura to kneel, and we pray for all these new officers, we pray that you lead them by your grace to do the works you have in store for them as they lead the church knowing that they are not alone, but blessed with the support of this congregation and loved by you and embraced by your spirit and your grace. Lord, uphold them in the offices to which you have called them. Let them live out their faith before you by inspiring us as your people to walk in your way and to share your mission with the world. Lord, hear our prayers and let them know that this mantle of leadership being passed to them for such a time as this comes from you, even as they and we follow in the blessed name of Christ our Lord and Savior, saying together as one people, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name, name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are now duly ordained and installed as officers in the ordered ministries of the PCUSA. And on behalf of the congregation, I say to you, we celebrate you today. We welcome your leadership in the years to come. And truly, we look forward to working with you to serving beside you. And we pray that God's blessing will be upon you today and always. 
Thanks be to God for your service and for who you are and for what you mean to this congregation and to our Lord. Amen. Amen. Beloved, in the name of the living God, receive this blessing. May the strength of the wind and the light of the sun, the softness of the rain and the mystery of the moon, reach you and fill you. May beauty delight you and happiness uplift you. May wonder surround you and love surround you. May your step be steady and your arm be strong. 
May your heart be peaceful and your word be true. May you seek to learn. May you learn to live. May you live to love. And may you love always. And as we go forth to serve the Lord, may God hold us in the palm of his hand, both now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.